think the last few months, of course, as has happened every month, but since word of explosion, we have been asking ourselves a very serious question about how we are serving God in our generation. The last few weeks, last month in particular, we spoke under the theme, God is working in me and through me. And what we explored is that how can we respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit when God wants to use us in line with our shape? We noted that we came into this world for a reason and for a purpose. And that God has a reason why he has brought us into this world. And we need to live out our lives in pursuit of God's purpose and in serving God in line with his purpose for our lives. This month, we want to start a different theme, but that talks to what we've been talking about the last two months. And the question we want to answer this month is, how can, how can you be in the perfect will of God? You know, that question has always been a question that as a young Christian, was prime on my mind. I used to ask myself that question. I mean, how do I know the will of God? And how can I be in the perfect will of God? This was a dominant thought that has always been in my mind as a young Christian, even now, but at least I know better now. As a young believer, I used to ask people questions. How can I know what is God's perfect will for my life? And people never used to know how to answer it. Some of them would actually tell you that, no, no, if you want to know God's will for your life, you must put out a fleece. Now, in the first service, when I used the word fleece, many people didn't know what I'm talking about. How many of you know what a fleece is? Don't raise your hand if you don't know, because I'm going to ask you to explain. <laughs> how many of you know what a fleece is? Can I see your hands? Raise it high. Let me see it. Oh, Shem. Banababat. You mean you don't know what a fleece is? All right, let me explain what a fleece is. Now, I'm not going to give you the scripture and the, the verse. All right? But there was a time when Jacob was uncertain about God's will in his life. And he asked God to show him a sign, a physical sign, that if you show me a sign and if such and such happens, I will then know how to determine what your will is. So a fleece is when we use natural physical circumstances to try and determine God's will for our lives. That's what most people do. They put out what they call a fleece. For instance, if you are interested in a lady here in the church, maybe you are sitting next to her. No, it's <laughs> Hang in there. Tell your neighbor, well, tell us it. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about the guy sitting next to you, all right? I'm just, just saying, okay, tell him. Look, he's just making an example. Just tell him. All right. Say, for instance, you, you are not sure if she's the one. You know, you, you want to know if, is it God's will for you to marry her? So you say, Lord, if it's your will for me to marry this lady, next week Sunday when I go to church, all right. <laughs> You're not even waiting for the whole story, some of you. Next week, Sunday, when I go to church, if she can sit next to me, <laughs> come on now, then I know it is your will for me to marry her. How many of you, how many of you have, what did they do on the screen? These camera people, they are very naughty. So, so you go and look for it. Jacob did that. So when you use a fleece, this is where you, you ask God for certain natural circumstances to happen. And then you determine. Now, that is not the best way to determine God's will. In fact, that is a very unsafe way of determining God's will because you don't know Nwanabatu Onabatu la Mopilahao. Nje. There was no other reason, all right? So they used to tell me things like that. Or people would say, 
if God really wants it to happen, it will happen by hook or crook. So there was no way people could tell how to determine God's will. So a lot of us in our young Christian lives, we were fumbling around, you know, not knowing how to know God's will. Now, there's things you can know God's will, but how do I know God's will for my life? How do I know the choice of career? To know that this is the career that God has for me. When I marry somebody, how do I know she's the one? How do I know he's the one? Because when they love you, then they try to come and overcome you because spiritual things will know. I saw a vision of you. And this guy, I want to You know, you don't know. But how do I know God's will? And that's an important thing. And it's even more important, Bazalana, because when we read Romans 12, we read a very interesting passage, verse 1, particularly the second part of verse 2. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. Now, verse 2 is where we want to focus, particularly the second part. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Paul says you must be able to prove what the will of God is so that you can live in the will of God. But then he says the will of God comes at three levels, right? And he uses a conjunction. He says that, that you may prove what is the, the what? What is the good will of God and the acceptable will of God and the, how it lasts little bit this morning, is there on the screen. So the word end is a conjunction. And the word end combines two thoughts, two different thoughts. And it means these thoughts or whatever is communicated is not one and the same. So when he talks about the will of God, he talks about the, the good will of God and the acceptable will of God and the perfect will of God. What we want is to be in the perfect will of God. Not in the acceptable will of God, because the acceptable will of God, God just accepts it. I'm going to explain, God just accepts it, but it's not his perfect will. The good will of God, it's good, Mara, mm, and we want to be in the perfect will of God. Listen to this. The perfect will of God is the complete will of God. It's the mature will of God. It is the full will of God. The good will of God and the acceptable will of God, allow me to use the term, both of them, I'll call them the imperfect will of God. It is God's will, but it's imperfect. All right? It's almost like you've scored six out of ten. When no pass it's a mara, you did well, mara, it's six out of ten, right? You didn't ace your exam, you just did six out of ten. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't want to sit next to people who are doing six out of ten here. I don't want to sit next to them. So, the imperfect will of God, watch this, Bazalana. It is what God allows men to do, even though it is not his first choice for them. So, there are certain places when you, when you live like that, when you do that, God allows it, but it's not his perfect will for you. In other words, you are not really in the sweet spot of God's will. And Paul says, I want you to live in the perfect will of God. It should be that in your decisions, in your career right now, in the choice of someone, oh, Munyeting, in terms of the way you handle your money, the way you handle your health, the way you handle everything in your life, it should be that everything in your life is in the perfect will of God. Not in something, okay, I'll accept it because there's nothing I can do about it, but you must be in the perfect will of God. Are you there, Bazalana, right? Are you there? Now, know this. This is important. The perfect will of God, A, because I've learned that you will alone get the A, D, D, B. So the perfect will of God, A, the perfect will of God is the place where God really wants us to be. 
So God is pleased with you when you are in his perfect will. And he's excited when your name is mentioned. All right? So most people haven't understood. There's a difference between God's, God loving us and God being pleased with us. Big difference. And when you listen to God's commands, or rather God's statement about Jesus Christ, his statement was not about the fact that he loves Jesus. But what he talked about the most is that he is pleased with Jesus. Because the fact of God loving us is a given. God loves you in spite of, not because of. So in spite of what we do, God loves us. God's love for us cannot be changed by anything. You can't be too sinful, too wrong for God not to love you. But on the other hand, it's not everybody who is pleasing God. Just like when you have children. You have children, you love those kids, but there are some of these kids. But you lay to lay. And there's eight, you curse eight. They break your heart. They are not pleasing to you. You love them. You'll always be a parent, but you're not pleased by them. You're not proud of them. You mention their name, but you always must qualify. Or a marayana. Or kind. How many of you are sitting next to somebody like that? Mariana or kind? <laughs> so Paul says, God wants us to be in the perfect will of God. So when you're in the perfect will of God, God is pleased with you. There are many of God's children, God's not pleased with them. Why? They're not in the perfect will of God. They're born again children of God. They will go to heaven when they die. But they will not get the rewards they're supposed to get in heaven. And God cannot parade them before the world and say, this is my beloved daughter, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When God talks about them, I says, this is my child, my ah. They are not in the sweet spot of my will. B, when we are in the perfect will of God, you are excellently positioned, fitting exactly in the original plan. You are in the right position. You are in the sweet spot. You know, in, in, in sports, you know, when you play cricket, when you hit that ball with a bat, you know, you've got to hit it in the sweet spot of the bat. And if you hit that ball in the sweet spot of the bat, you can control the direction of that ball. You can do with that ball what you want because you've hit it right in the sweet spot. In tennis, you know, you, you want to hit the, the, the tennis ball with the center of your racket. You can either do a lob, you can slice the ball, you can play cross court, you can do whatever. You know, you can control the ball because you've hit it in the sweet spot. In golf, you know, you, you know you, when you hit the golf ball in the sweet spot, it doesn't even feel like you've hit a ball. It's so light. It goes far and you can direct it, you know. But if you are like some of us who, who are still starting, you know, you take the entire ground and the grass and the, and the ants that are there. In fact, somebody once told me a story, and I know it's not a true story, but he was explaining that there was this guy who was trying to play golf, and he put the golf ball. It's a very strange game. Put the, particularly those of you who are show off or young Zabakomba. He's a comba, yo. So he put the golf ball on the ground, and he swung and hit it. Barikokai. Barikiyomo. He tried several times, and they said there was an ant that was, that was in the ground, you know, on the ground, and he kept hitting this ant. You know, it's a story. It's not true. He kept hitting the ground, and this ant finally said, I better get on top of the golf ball because this guy, instead of hitting the golf ball, is hitting the ground. So this is a safe space, you know. But you see, when you hit it in the sweet spot, you drive it far. You can do with it what you want. But there are many of God's people God can't do with you what he wants. Because you're not in the sweet spot. You're God's children. He likes you. But he's not pleased with you. Because we're not in his perfect will. Most people haven't taken the time to find out where I am now. Am I in the will of God? Where I am now. This job that I'm working, this career that I'm following, is this the person God wants me to marry? 
Now, in the imperfect will of God, A, God allows his children into the imperfect will because of their rebelliousness and their rejection of his original and perfect plan for them. Many people don't know how to tell when it's not God's will. So because they didn't know how to tell when it's not God's will, they still went ahead and made the decision. I can tell you, you're going to find out in this series, God is talking to you all the time. Tell your neighbor, God is talking to you all the time. The problem is we're not listening. The problem is we are looking at other ways of God talking to us and missing the fundamental way that God said is going to speak to us that way. People are looking for a vision. They're looking for a dream. Hmm? People want an earthquake. They are doing a fleece. You're using everything that God never said. He's going to use that, you know. God is in FM wavelength. We're not called medium wave. See, see. You're trying to connect to cell C. Kasim cut. Yeah, empty air. And you can't understand why you're not picking up the signal. Because you are, you are looking in the, in the wrong place. You are connected to the wrong place. So most people, sometimes people use their feelings. Sometimes people use circumstances. You see. Sometimes people say, God show me a sign. You know, they're going back to the Old Testament. And I've realized there's a lot of people who are using Old Testament style of trying to determine God's will. Some of you, you go and consult with prophets. That's not God's will. That's not God's way. God never says God speak to you through prophets. Look at your neighbor and say, how to you so? Gabon. Bow your head and and you are still out of the will of God. Even now, you keep going back. Why? Because many of God's people, they are lazy to do their work for themselves. They'd rather somebody else do it for them. Yeah, lay hands on me and tell me what God wants me to do. No, 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 no. There's a way and I will show you how God speaks to you. Be being in the perfect will, of, in perfect will of God, God is not really pleased with you. He is just accommodating you. He's just being patient with you and not, Bazalana, giving you time to repent. See, in the imperfect will of God, you may seem to have God's favor, but you are incomplete in your service to the Lord, not fulfilling God's original purpose for your life. You see, when you're not in the perfect will of God, you may kid yourself that you have God's favor. But in the long run, you're going to run out of that favor. You cannot continue in the imperfect will of God forever and expect things to work out for you. It's going to catch up with you one day. And it's in the same way when people do things that are wrong. Somebody steals and they think they'll never be caught. They lie. They think they'll never be caught. They cheat. They think they'll never be caught. They get caught up. They think they'll never be caught. Hey, one day is one day. If you're not caught on this earth, in heaven, a day of reckoning will come. No, nobody gets away with anything. Mm -mm. We are all going to give an account for our life, right? So in the imperfect will of God, you'll find that it may look, things may look good for a while, but one day everything will come to a crashing halt. And it's a sad day. D, in the imperfect will of God, it's a place where we are inappropriately positioned and were unqualified for the job. I think about it today, and I was telling them Koyem on Friday. One of the challenges I left the young people is this, that you got to determine as early as possible in your life what God has called you to do. And when I talk about calling, I'm not talking about being a pastor necessarily. All of us are called. All of us are called. Whether you're a teacher or a lawyer, or mechanic, all of us are called. And I was saying to them, the sooner you find out what you are called to do with your life, the sooner you start, the better. It takes a long time, Basalana, to get traction in many of these things. It takes a long time. Even to have impact, it takes a long time. Now, I know today, you know, it's not uncommon for people to work for this company, work for this company, three months more, six months more, seven months more, eight months more. That, that might be good when people want to just earn money and earn money, go higher, go higher. Wah, 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 wah. It's all right. But if you want to have impact, if you want to have real impact, if you really want to change things, change things, it takes a while. To, to be 
where you're called and to labor for a long time. Takes a while. Takes a while. So you young people, take this someone seriously. Take it seriously. Make sure you apply it so that as early as possible, you have figured out what God's will is for your life in terms of your career or your calling. And get busy with that and spend the rest of your life in pursuit of that. Yeah. I, I've never, I, I, I still have yet to see in ministry, maybe I'm talking about our field. In ministry, I have yet to see ministries that have had impact where people didn't take, didn't take them a long time. It takes a lot of years to have impact. It takes a very, very long time to have impact. I know sometimes today we get lucky because we have so many hits, you know, on social media and then we become popular and it becomes the biggest thing. But the problem with some of that is that people get big but they haven't developed character. What they are doing is big. Marabona inside, they are still small. They haven't developed. The way for a generic way of growing with God is that you've got to stay with something for a long time because as God grows what you're doing, he's growing you as well. Why? So that when you are successful, you don't become big-headed. God wants you, oh, you're not hearing what I'm saying. God wants you to grow into your success. That's why sometimes people who have bumped into success prematurely, they become big-headed. Because now they have a break, they are calling everybody by names. They're boasting to everybody. You can't talk to them. Their head is so big. But you see, when you go through the process of growth, in Bible terminology, first the grain, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear, there's always the law of progression. Not only is God expanding what you're doing, God is expanding you on the inside. And the day you handle power, the day you are, you are breaking news and front page newspaper, you'll still handle that with humility. Not only that, you will not forget the people who were where you used to be years ago. You'll still associate with them. You will still love them. You will still want to do good for them. When God gives you money, you don't squander it. You remember those who didn't have because you understand what you went through. Yeah. Yeah. So, young people, if you could figure it out when you are still young, by the grace of God, I pray that you will know and throw yourself to it. I was telling them, I think last week I mentioned it. You know, John Piper, one of the things he said that really struck a chord in my heart. He, he, was, he said he was talking at Harvard University, you know, and he was telling the, the he's, a, he's a preacher. He says he was telling the students there, he said, you know, I found out in life to be successful, you don't have to know a lot of things. Now that sounds like an oxymoron. Said, so, you know, to be a successful person in life, you don't have to know a lot of things. Because there's a lot of people who know a lot of things and they're not successful. Secondly, he said, to be successful in life, you really don't have to be rich. Uh, I know you don't like that, Simon. You really don't have, thirdly, you really don't have to be superly gifted, extraordinarily gifted. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't even have to have charisma. He said, I found out in life, to be successful, you must figure out what you were born for. <laughs> Connect with that and throw your all into that. He says, to be successful in life, find two or three things that you can give your all to. Then you will succeed in life. Now, we have people who don't make it in life. They're the brightest people, the most talented people. They've got the resources. They've got the connections. They've got the charisma. They've got the walk. They've got the look. Why? Because they're in the wrong place. They're not in God's will. And because they are good with everything, they always are shifting from one thing to the other. They're not patient enough to stay with one thing. They have options. So at the end of their lives, they've done 20 things, but they've mastered none of them. Look at your neighbor say, Oh, yeah, lo bishop. No more at amen. Oh, yeah, shumela lo bishop. If you're going to learn, oh, yeah, lo bishop. Yeah. You look at people in all industries, Basalan. They've stayed... Even if it's many things, it's many things in the same field. 
If it's finance, they've stayed in the finance field. They may diversify, but they've stayed in the finance field. I want to talk about that, but uh, <laughs> let me give you some of the examples of people who have moved into the imperfect will of God. In First Samuel chapter 8, from verse 4, Israel entered into the imperfect will of God by insisting on having a king. The way Israel was governed at the time, it was through, to oversimplify it, judges or elders who ruled it. They didn't have a king. God was their king. So how instructions came is that God would speak through the prophet to the nation. Remember, they were in the Old Testament, so that's the way God spoke. God would speak to the prophet, to the nation. So it was God honor who set the laws. So God sets laws, and he said hygienic laws, he said relational laws, laws that dealt with finance and laws that dealt with social issues. You know, how do you treat people who are poverty stricken? What do you do? You know, and you must, and then he said, this is what you do for my house in the temple. You give a tenth, you do those. And God said, if you read the book of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's really about how to run a country. Focusing on all areas, on spiritual matters and social matters, on issues that have to do with health and things that have to do with, you know, everything. You know, God showed them how to run their homes and what must happen in a house, how they must, how they must teach the younger ones. And God was their king. God said everything. But when they looked at other nations, they said, never. Other nations have a king. We want one. We want one. So we're reading that scripture now in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you can turn there with me. So when Samuel was old, who was a priest, they came to him and they said, no, nah. he was trying to appoint judges for them. All right? But his sons were not good. Verse 4, finally all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. So they said to him, you are old, your sons are not like you. Give us a king. Give us a king to judge us like all other nations. So we want a king. We don't want judges anymore. We don't want anyone who's going to be a, a prophet over us. We don't want any of that. We want to do what other nations are doing. And you know, sometimes we think we know better than God. Yeah. So someone was displeased with their request, verse 6, went to the Lord for guidance. This is in the New Living Translation. Do everything they say, the Lord replied. Huh? Do everything they say. For it is me that they are rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be king over them any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they've continually abandoned me and followed other gods, and now they're giving you the same treatment. Look at verse 9. Do as they ask. So God is, is, is yielding to the people's pressure. They're lobbying. It's a pressure group. Viva! God says, all right, I'll allow it. It's not my perfect will. It's not my perfect will. It's my acceptable will. It's my good will. I'll allow it. I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll say something after this. Do as they ask, verse 9, but solemnly warn them. Warn them the way a king will rule over them. They don't know what they are pressuring me for. You know, many times as human beings, we put pressure on things. That we don't know why. We don't know the outcome. But Ralwan. Oh, yeah. You know, I've seen it in, in some places where people have, they've, they've ousted the pastor, pushed him out, kicked him out through pressure groups. You know, Simfun, you know, sometimes church members think they know better who should be the next pastor. They're being very naive. They're being very naive. So I see them push out Muruti and do all this and no, no, no. And then Muruti was about to answer it. After that, really. He got it into him. Yeah. And then they themselves, they, they start finding out that even if they were fighting side by side to push the pastor out, they had not discussed who's, who's going to be the leader between us. Yeah, because you see, when, 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 when you collaborate to push somebody out, you never discuss. You see, so you see, these groups that were a whole group, few months after they split the church. 
No, but they start fighting. And then they realize how the pastor kept everything together. And it looked very easy. I'll tell you why. Because he was in the will of God. He was in the will of God. Yeah? And people pushed. Put pressure. You know, sometimes people pressure. That's why in our church, we don't use the voting system when it comes to what we must do in the church. I never ask you, Uri, can you vote? Can we build another church? We'll never do that in this church. We don't do that. That's not God's way of running a church. Some of vote answering, hey, or I vote and I just choose you. It, it was determined by God before you came, and even after you leave, God will still determine. Okay? So no matter how many lobby groups we're going to have on certain issues, just forget it. It's not going to work. It's not how you run a church. So they pushed. Now note what now what happens in verse 10. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. He says, look, this is how a king will reign over you. He will draft your sons and assign them to chariots and charioteers, making them run before chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow in his fields, harvest his crops. Some will make him weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you, force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and oil grows and give them to his own officials. Now, one of the officials said, Sherelana, eh? Yeah. Sherelana. See, see, see. God would never do that to us. But I get a robot like a king. He will take a tenth of your grain, your grape harvest, and distribute it among the officers and attendants. So, unka takes aluna and aretokale. He will take your. Yeah. So it was banned because now the children of Israel had to pay 10% for their tithes and offerings. And now, because they've wanted a king, now they have to go into a system of taxation. In fact, I don't know how many of you have ever read this. You go and read how the Jews had a problem with tax in the New Testament. They'd always complain. And, and Jesus was kind of saying, hey, you guys, you are the ones who wanted the king. Little along. Under God's way of running a government, you only had to pay tithes. To your church, there was no tax. Now you have to pay 10%. We are paying 40%. It's, 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 it's when we push, now we want our way. Oh my goodness. Human beings. We think we know. He says, he will take a tenth of your grains, verse 16. He will take your male and female slaves, demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his use. He will demand a tenth of your flock and you'll be the slaves. And when that day comes, you will beg for relief from the king. You are demanding, but then the Lord will not help you. See, if you insist on things, then you want to say, God help. <laughs> he says, you want God to help you, but the people refuse to listen to someone's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they say. We want to be like the other nations around the world. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said, and the Lord replied, well, do as they say. Bah, faster. Give them a king. This is what I heard, Bazalana. One preacher was teaching on this, and this was a critical point he made. i never forget this. He said he was counseling somebody who had gotten into a bad marriage. Very bad marriage. Things were really bad. And, and I mean, you know, like we do as, as pastors, try to help people. But you know, sometimes we, we try to help when the foundation was wrong from day one. Now, God is always gracious. He'll try to help, but it's very difficult to help something that has a wrong foundation. This, this, it was laid in this instance, not just her, but just happened to be her. She had prayed about a life partner. And so this guy proposed marriage to her. But she was not comfortable because she wasn't sure about certain things. But he didn't know, really, how to know God's will. She kept on having a check in her spirit. Not check, yeah, check, yeah, check, yeah, check. <laughs> like uh, something hindering in her spirit. She had some discomfort. We're going to discuss that the coming weeks. 
I'll explain it to you. She had a discomfort. The way God leads is by way of peace, Colossians 1. But this lady, even if she knew, she wasn't sure. But because she really wanted to be married, she pressed the override button. So she insisted and kept on praying until one day when she prayed, the discomfort was no longer there. And because the discomfort was no longer there, she made an assumption that God says, who right? So she went ahead and got married. And it was the worst decision she's ever made. And God said to this pastor, he said, you see what she did? If my people, if my people want something hard enough and they will not listen to me even when I say no, I'll allow them to have it but they'll have to live with the consequences thereof. Yeah. And this is what most people have never figured out, why you must keep your conscience tender. Learn to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and do it at that time. Don't push the boundaries. Don't push your tolerance level. Some of you, you are living with somebody in sin. When you started, you were uncomfortable about it. You are making the assumption that because you no longer feel guilt about it, it should be right. But it's not right. You've pushed God. And you've stepped out of God's perfect will into something else. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, Bazalan, our conscience is like the palate of a baby. Babies, because their palate is sensitive, innocent, virgin, if I can use that term, untouched, untempered with, they can pick up any taste, no matter how small. Put a little bit of sugar, they can tell there's sugar. Put a little bit of salt, they can tell there's a bit of salt. Because their palate hasn't tasted anything. And when, when anything that's above the ordinary comes on it, it can pick it up. And you can't give them hot things. You've got to cool it down. Because the palate is still sensitive. But as we grow, by consistently pushing our palate into new boundaries, making the temperature to be hotter, the salt to be saltier, the sugar to be sugar. Yeah. What happens? We develop a tolerance level. Now listen, when you're drinking that hot tea, it's not that it's not hot. It's because your tolerance level has been adjusted. Yeah. Watch, watch. So you young Christians, when you see an older Christian, and you know they are shaking up together, don't use that as an example. That's one of the things as a young Christian that always used to be a problem to me. I would see older Christians doing things that I didn't have the comfort to do. But remember, I was a Baby Christian. Baby Christian. So my conscience, my palate of conscience is at a babyhood stage. Because Abazalona, the more we grow, instead of keeping our conscience tender, is the more we push boundaries when it comes to God. When I was a young Christian, I used to think, my friend, I, had a, I have a friend, Murti Kenneth Makop. He used to catch me lying. He used to catch me lying. He knew when I was lying. And he would tell me, Wamaka. And, and I thought, I, honestly, I thought this man knows everything. So when I was going to see him, I would make sure me Oh, Jesus. I would make sure I live right. I do what's right. 
because I didn't want to come into his presence because I was afraid he's going to call me out. But after a while, I noticed good to know. There are days when he doesn't know. <laughs> then I noticed good to know. Okay, now he's not perfect. Then what happens? I relaxed. Thank God I changed. But I relaxed and started doing things that are wrong. Telling lies. It was the problem of the biggest one was a lying one. So I tell him lies, and I realized he didn't realize I lied this time. So what happens? So don't laugh at me now. <laughs> so what happens? Then I relaxed around him. I started fumbling around with lies, pushing my back. So I started getting accustomed to being a lying Christian. Yet when I was a young Christian, I didn't want to lie because I thought God's going to kill me overnight. But I lied, and I realized God didn't kill me. So then you go back to lying. So you did my kwapeni, you realized when you came to the service, there was a service when I said, somebody, yeah, 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 you said, yeah, bishop, yo, yo. But then afterwards, I went on and I said, today I have on. So now, so shama kwapen, you are comfortable. It's not that God has accepted it, you, you, you've pushed him. You've pushed the boundaries. And I can tell you, Basalan, living with that adjusted Conscience is detrimental to your life. Because once you lose your ability to hear God, you know why, Basana, they don't want loud music? Do you know why? I once heard a, a doctor, uh, Abu Akekana King, doctor, what is it? An ENT specialist, yeah. Uh, and the, when you spend, yeah, it's ENT, right? Yeah, ENT specialist. Do you know why Basana, they don't want us with loud music? Do you, know, do you know why? And those of you who like to wear headphones and just full blast, boom, 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 boom. You know what it does? Damages your ear. It causes you to not hear music that's much lower. So when you are old, I don't want to say, huh? 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 Because... Because, listen, Basala, because, because, listen to me. When you are young, you don't understand the damage you're causing. You don't realize that, you see, when you are young, your, 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 your recovery and your bounce back is, is much higher because you are young. I mean, if you've gone to an all, if you, go, if, if you partied all night and you drank the whole night, right? So in the morning, what's all? You are young. At that stage, it doesn't matter. Mara, the damage has started. Yeah. Yeah. So you drink, you sleep around, you lie, you cheat, you do all, you do all, you just feel a watuba, wa noa, ueta in, uruva la leiti, wa uto, uwa maka, wa, whoa! Jesus! Hey! You are young, it's all right, urubu shabako, it's okay! But the problem is that showing up when you get into your 40s. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of the things you're doing, you are addicted to them. You can't live without alcohol. You can't live without smoking. You can't. You can't be stable in your marriage, even if you're dealer, because you used to sleep around with women. You can't be faithful to one. You have to jump around to satisfy your appetite. Because that's what you developed in your youth. That's what you developed. Even if God was speaking to you and God was saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. No, no. So, you see, it, it, it's, it's, at that stage, it doesn't mean anything. It's when you, there's a certain threshold when you cross it. It's downhill all the way. When you are in that stage where you can't live without drugs. I mean, you see great people. And I'm not saying it in a bad way, but what a great talent of Whitney Houston. Do you know Whitney Houston? She started singing in church. She was discovered in church. And this is why I get angry with the world. They come here and they see this great talent. And it's unfortunate. We can't, we can't compete with the secular world when it comes to paying we, we can't. But they come here and they promise these kids, 
And, and let me tell you, the world out there, it's not that they like you. They like what they're going to get because of you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They thrive because of you. And then what happened? When we you, you still what as the rock bottom, where were they? That's what the world will do to you. Where were they? They were not there. It was her church that had to pick up the ashes. That's a sad thing for us as pastors. When people are in their prime, they're too proud for us. We don't deserve them. And when they're all ashes, we have to go and pick them up. Buried in her church that she never gave the prime of her life to. The prime of her life, she spent it everywhere else. And she got hooked on drugs. What happened? She crossed a line. I tell you, what, you cross a line. Cross a line. Don't push your conscience to that level. When you feel a discomfort, stop. Let them call you a fool, but it's okay. Oh, somebody shout to the Lord, it's okay. I said, it's okay. Let them call you a fool. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I say this with sadness, Barcelona. Many of us, we grew up, you know, seeing our friends go into this. And when you see what has become of your friends, you started with them in the same things. I'm telling you the truth. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Fidgeted around as teenagers in trying to drink, smoking. Thank God for a good home. Thank God for good parents. Yes. Thank God for good parents who don't, who don't, who don't, who challenge their children. Not some of the parents today who encourage their children in wrong things. I saw something to, not long, I think it's on YouTube or it's on WhatsApp. Hey, you are not saying to your grandchild You know what Koko Baba current is? The bomb cool Baba hip hop Baba. I thought you, Koko, you you are not you are not you are not encouraging your child. Ukshat, Koko. So you don't mind Lomzugulu Wako, this boy, Magachalabantuana everywhere, Koko. You've never asked the effects of that. Never mind him. What about these kids? Who at the death of their father will meet there, all of them and find out for the first time that they are siblings? Koko, do you ever think about that? But that's because that's the standard our world has accepted. And we push these boundaries and we push what God, God says get married. We say no, so food and chat. So marriage is no longer the thing now. People don't get married anymore. No. And yet when you go back into the history and the culture of all communities around the world, all communities around the world, they used to get married. They had a way of getting married. It may not be similar, but there are several things that are the same. Number one, there has to be a covenant. Number two, there has to be involvement of family or friends. Thirdly, there has to be a ceremony that recognizes that these people are getting into covenant. Only then would they live together. Even like I we never used to just ring to If you talk to people who know culture, see So, but you, you don't know. But people will get. There was a way in which it's done. It has to be recognized. See, so in our case, okay, okay, well, but once a lovola, if Basa and self got the ring, but there has to be a way. Parents must be involved. There has to be some covenant. We must really shut this before we want to go room one. We need to. We need to. Biblically, sex is meant for married people, period. Yeah, no, I know, no, I know. The world doesn't marry anymore. I mean, there's a prince of a country not long ago who got married, you know? But they took out the videos, and I was watching this, and I was thinking, how the world is brainwashing us. He used to travel around with this girlfriend of his. 
going to different countries doing philanthropic work. They are sharing the same hotel room. And I'm thinking, oh, shut down and all. Yeah, you see, some of you are no longer thinking like that. This is how we are conditioned. This is how our tolerance level is adjusted. Where we start accepting things that were never God's will in the first place. We push the boundaries with God. You go to Europe, people don't marry anymore. You go to, you talk to people, they say, what's marriage? What's marriage? What's this? What's this? You know, what's this? So the way people work is then they don't marry. They just check up together. You see? And then when things go wrong, the one cries out and says, you are not faithful. Faithful to what? There was no bond. There was no covenant. Faithful to what? You never discussed it. Nobody, nobody said anything. We just jumped in and stayed together. And it's done for convenience so that if I feel like I don't fit with this one, I can change them. So we go test driving each other. And that's the way the world is doing. Test drive this one, test drive this one, test drive this one, test drive this one, test drive this one. And then when you are in your 40s or late 40s, Kona would decide to settle down. I can let you to settle down. To settle down. To settle down. Test drive you. But the problem of, of, of and, 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 but this is not the Bible. This is just me. Okay, kinder. That's the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Don't use it. If, if, I, was to, if I was to suggest to you young people, I would say this. I would say this. Marry when you are young, right? With somebody all in Paru or Tonandoel. Okay? Their career is not yet established. And together, as husband and wife, carve out a future with each other side by side. Let's arrive. Because statistics show when people marry, when they already are at a certain stage in their lives, you bring two people by stubborn. They already have an acquired taste. They already are set in their habits. They are not moving. So the marriage is no longer a covenant, it's a negotiation. Yeah. Now, you may not like it. It's, it's fine if you don't like it. It's fine. I'm saying this because we counsel hundreds and hundreds of people and we see the fruit of our disobedience. People don't want to marry today. Yeah. So they move from one relationship to the other to the other. And you're not asking what it does to the children. We have to be raised in families without a dad, without a mom. They have to be adjusting to every family. Nobody asks that question. We never ask the children what they want. We've never no, no, we're living our lives, right? We think children will adapt. I get a child. Yeah, we will take them for psychological counseling. I'm going to do that's what we're saying. We never asked. But you see, we are complicating our lives like the children of Israel did because what God wants and what God commands is not what we want. We want our way. We don't better than you, God. Marriage out the window. Don't tell me about marriage. Maybe finally I'll find somebody. And by the time you settle down, by the time you settle down, you are set in your ways, you are stubborn, you are everything, and you meet somebody who's equally as stubborn as you. And then the marriages don't last. Or even if they are there, you can see it's a facade. These people are not happy. They have to do it for the camera and smile and hug each other for us. Mara, we know, good to know. But you know why we say all this, Barcelona? Is because in spite of all that, in spite of all that, God reaches to us and still loves us. Yeah. Yeah. Let me close. Let me close. Let me close. One pastor was praying for a church member of his who was dying, lying in the hospital bed, dying. And the pastor was so sad. And he's praying and said, God, I'm not going to let this member die. I'm standing in the gap for him, praying. God says, no, he's going to die. It's part of your prayer. I said, no, God. I prayed for many other people. I didn't raise them from the dead, but I was, I was able to ask for longer days. God said, no, I'm not going to do it. He said, all right, God. Just promise me one thing. Let them come out of this coma. At least so that I can talk to them before they pass on. 
and then at least then they can come home. God said, it's okay. And God said, you know, you know why is it that I'm not going to let this guy live? And the pastor said, no, I don't know. He said, see this guy? He's been a Christian for many years. 15 years. And not once has he ever lived right for more than a week. Yeah. Not once. This guy has walked on the edge of danger. Walked next to hell so much. But a few months ago, before he got into this condition, he made things right with me. And for the first time in 15 years, he did things right. He said, as I speak, even if he's in a coma, he is in the best spiritual condition. And I'd rather he comes home now than heal him and have him go back to his old ways. I'd rather he dies now. At least he can come into heaven. He, he will lose his rewards. But at least he will lose his rewards. Because I would rather hunger Zuluini and lose the rewards than go on living and end up in the pit of hell. Foolish what you it's okay. A few minutes there after the man came off, Khan came out of the of the coma, sat up in bed, and said to him, Oh, I'm so glad to see you. He said, I'm so glad to see you, you know. I've been having such a great time with the Lord and they, we had a great conversation. And this man said, I could hear from what he was saying, even if he doesn't know what God had said to me, but I could recognize a lot of what he was talking about. And he said, he said this man said, I'm going home. He said, I know. He said, I'm so happy I'm going home. He said, I know. He said, okay, please pray for me. Prayed for him to get filled with the Holy Spirit. The man got filled with the Spirit, he left. Three days later, he went home to be with the Lord. And the nurses give a report. For three days, this man was praying in the spirit night and day. What a way to go home. What a way to go home. But even more, even more, what a reckless love of God. What a love. That God will do everything in his power, at least to go to Genezului. And he would rather you, you go home knowing what is on Genazuluin instead of him giving you more days to live in danger of hell. What a love. This pastor said, when I heard that this man has passed on, I, I, I was singing Amazing Grace. He says, you know, I'm not much of a singer, Mara. I sang with tears in my eyes. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The reckless love of God calls on you this morning. No matter how much you've made the wrong decisions, it's not the end of your life. I said it's not the end of your life. It's up to you. It's up to you. Some of you, you are here. And you look at your life, it's been wrecked with all kinds of things. There's still hope for you. Some of you, you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord. This is the day where you can ask Jesus to come into your heart. Or maybe you may be one of those Christians. You are born again, Mara. Eh? You are here, Utsuhako, Rumung Lima Kwape. You're here. You're here. Yeah. You're walking on the edge. You're pushing your tolerance level. You're moving into the imperfect will of God. At heart, you are not at peace. Mara, because you don't feel resistance anymore, you keep doing it, you're trying to normalize it. You're trying to, you're trying to make it good. You're trying to make it cool, but you know it's not. God's love reaches out to you. That love of God that looks beyond our faults. And the crowd used to sing a song. Amazing grace. That God would love someone like me. It says it was grace that looked at me, saved me, and looked beyond my faults and saw my need. 
God looks beyond your faults today. He doesn't want you to settle in them. He wants you to correct them. He sees your need. Will you respond to him? And as I pray today, I want to call on you. Don't leave this place with guilt. Don't go back home beating yourself on the head. There's no need for that. This is a huge hospital. Divine hospital. Where God is in the ICU unit. Doing operations at the highest level of all. Changing people's hearts. Taking out the heart of stone and putting in the heart of flesh. This is the place where God is able to purge our conscience through the blood of Christ. Purge it from dead works. Rub off all the things you've tolerated. Reset it. Recalibrate it. Set the tolerance level to a new level again. That once more you can, you can hear when God speaks. And you can say, God, I hear you. I'll do what you've called me to do. Bow your heads with me. Kise ki utwinde Jesu Hau pizza You see, it's, 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 it's your choice as you are sitting here and listening to the word. Bow your heads, please close your eyes. If you are here today, and those of you watching by way of streaming, wherever you are, whatever church you are in, right where you are, if you say, today is my day of decision making. I want to make things right with God. I want God to forgive me of my wrong. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with the blood of Christ. Reset my tolerance level. I need prayer. I want to invite Christ in my life to be the Savior and the Lord of my life. Or I used to live for God, but I went the wrong way. I started doing things I shouldn't do and tolerating things I shouldn't tolerate. But today I want to come back home like the prodigal son, would you pray for me? Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that is you and you need the prayer, whatever category that I've talked about and you need prayer, just raise your hand right where you are. I want to pray for you. Just raise it high. Let me see it. Thank you for those hands all over the place. Can the people who raise their hands stand on their feet, please, where they are? Just stand on your feet, everybody. Just stand. Eki do metsi Tole murena Tate kakuji sise I want to ask if you are still seated and you need prayer. I don't know why you are still seated. When the grace of God is abundant. And the reckless love of God calls for you. Can you gather enough courage to join these people who are standing, please? I ask you. Stand where you are. Don't remain seated. There's no need for you to go back with condemnation and guilt and everything. You can leave it all here at the altar. You can leave it all here. At the feet of Jesus Christ, who calls you today, who beckons to you today, who said, my son, my daughter, come home, come home, come home. My love is looking for you. My love is searching for you. I want to pray for every one of you who's standing. I'm going to ask you, can you take all your belongings, please? And, and can you come from where you are standing and come stand in front of the stage, looking at the stage, looking towards me. I want to pray for you. Give them a big hand as they walk.